My guest today is Jonathan Finlayson, great trumpet player, composer, band leader. Um, he's been playing with Steve Coleman's band for over 20 years. Um, he's also played with some other giants in the field, Mary Halverson, Steve Lehman, Henry Threadgill, the list goes on. Um, please check out his music on the links below. Also a really nice guy. Um, yeah, we talked a lot about his development and his practice routines and his musical upbringing. Really interesting stuff. So I hope you like it. And if you do, please like and subscribe. And I'll see you on the other side. Bye. Uh, Dave Blue mentioned this term that I've not heard before called pivoting. And I think from my understanding, he means just like flexibility and able to move around the trumpet. And what, how did this come to be? Like, how, how do you have such control of the instrument? Mm. I always feel like I'm catching up to music in that I'm, there's music that's been put in front of me that is like a, a goal. Like it's like a, a lot of challenging music I've played that I wish I could play better. And within that, within those challenges are, are things that I know I, I want and need to work on and things I would like to be able to do more fastly. So I'm just trying to shore up, shore up those feelings of like being able to better control and and manage those expectations. And over time, I've gotten better. <laughs> Keep trying. <laughs> what kind of things do you practice on a daily basis? Do you, I assume, long tones and... Uh, it, yeah, long tones, and lip slurs, and uh, not a heavy amount. Long tones, lip slurs, scales. It's, these days it's all very, very basic. What do you mean? Nothing... Nothing out of the ordinary, I'd say. I play some melodies sometimes. I feel like the kind of echoing what I just said, like the, the practice comes with projects, you know? Like the things I do at home are to prepare myself for something that I probably can't do or will have trouble doing, <laughs> you know? And then I do a project and then someone's like, can you do this? And I'm like, I, I will try. <laughs> Can you think of an example of something that's been exceedingly hard uh, and you've surmounted? Recently I did a uh, recording with uh, Steve Lehman and there's this piece called Les Treize Soleil, which it's very, I don't know. Angular? It's kind of angular. It has a, a steady meter. It's not in four. Something is elongated, I forget. But then there's a lot of information on top of that. There's a lot of sounds going on around. And we have this line in unison. And it's it's a little, it's difficult, you know. Uh, there's some, like, things about the timing that, that can be tricky. I feel like me working on that, that's like an addition to my practice. Or that's something that I can, I can add to my ability because they put it in front of me, you know. How do horn players, or how do you approach getting better at at the rhythm part of music? I think a lot of it has to do with simple exposure and um, recognition, like that you want to do it and that it is a thing that you want to work on. And then I was, I mean, not forced, but just because of the nature of the groups that I played in, like it was something that had to had to be addressed. <laughs> <laughs> did you feel like addressing it on the bandstand, or did you take some of these things home and both practice them? Both. Yeah. There were there were numerous. <laughs> I give you a bunch of examples, but uh, even like my. The beginnings, like when I was playing with Steve, there would be simple rhythms that, like, he would play like a cowbell. And then. I'm sorry, you're playing the no, cowbell he part? No, playing the cowbell. Oh, he's playing the cowbell. Okay. And I would, I would listen, and then he would hand me the cowbell, and then I would realize that I couldn't do it, or that I could get it right like two times, and then 
I'd lose it or whatever would happen. Like it just was very unsuccessful. And I was like, oh, I thought I could do it. It sounded simple enough standing, but then like the experience of it was completely different. I was like, oh my God, I, I thought I could. And then the other thing was when that music in particular, the the relationships are aren't static, and so where you knew how to get in one place is not how you get in the next place. You know, so if you can't hear that, if all you can hear is the one rhythm, and you're just going to focus on that, then the whole scenery passes you by in a, in a way because that one rhythm is it's not the most important thing. It's it's the whole it's all the rhythms you have to familiarize yourself with this vast relationship and then also the individual rhythms and the vast relationship has the sound the larger relationship has the sound and the individual rhythms have the sound and how they all work together and so in the course of being confronted with that daily i was like oh i gotta i have to figure some things out <laughs> and how did you figure those things out very simply at first uh, we do a lot of clapping and singing. And even that I, I thought was going to be simple and wasn't. And you're doing it with him or with other people in the band? You could just take two, two really, uh, well, I, I first started with, um, the goal was to do it yourself. Sing one part and clap the other. Or to tap your foot on one thing and then improvise on it or whatever it is to create two different relationships or a composite relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, so I started trying to sing things and clap things and to just bend your brain in a way, you know, even to sing things and clap things that are in, that are uh, commensurate in the, in the same span. It's it was difficult. It was all like I was like, oh, I thought I was looking at it. It was just like, oh, I, I can do that. Of course I can do that, and then you have to do it. Yeah, and, and then you're like, oh my god. So I realized very quickly, I was like, oh man, I can't do, I can't do any of these things. I can't hold a pattern. I, I can't, uh, I can't hear where to come in. You know? mm. So being able to do that in that context, I know this seems probably so obvious, but can you speak to how that influences playing in other groups? I have this this experience of playing these very demanding music and uh, improvising over these types of forms and having to hear these things. It only improves your musicianship. You can take that, take those things anywhere, you know. There's a lot of listening involved. I mean, it's all the things that one strives for in being a musician. And then in another context, like playing with Mark Morris, there's this other handful of things that I don't have to do in that group that I I need to you know, be better about, like listening to the vocalists and feeling the actual vibe of like a piece and how to make my sound correlate with with the emotion of this piece versus mm. this one and when to play brassy and when not and which these are other things are just me paying more attention but like not necessarily called upon for other gigs yeah know. but do you still work on playing tunes and standards i still do it mm -hmm. i still love to to play <laughs> I go to a jam session every now and then. I, there's this one session up in Harlem that I go to on Sundays called The Legion. That's probably, it's like walking distance from my house. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. When you moved to New York, did you go to a bunch of jam sessions? Oh, I tried to make all of them. You did? Up and yeah. down and all around. I went to the, to the up, and, up and Over Jazz Cafe, which is not there anymore. Robert Glasper did a lot of... Uh, residencies there. I feel like that's one of the places where his he was able to really develop his his, oh, his trio thing in, back in the day. I used to go there. I used to go to St. Nick's Pub. 
like a big zigzag. I didn't live anywhere near any of these places. They but but you don't me. live this kind of uh, jam session no. life. Yeah, no, no. it's exhausting. <laughs> well, you, you end up playing more. Sicilian Defense has got to be the best band name. <laughs> and it's, it's hard. I like leading a band, and then leading a band is also can be difficult. Yeah, yeah. Quite difficult. So it's... You, you mean difficult like in the booking of gigs and that kind of thing, or the actual putting the pieces together? I like that part. <laughs> That's the fun part. It's the gigs, and sometimes I feel like I'm not, I don't want to just do gigs. Like, hear me out. So, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I like playing with, with groups, with my group, but I sometimes I just, am I booking gigs just to play the same music over again? Like, I, I waver sometimes. I, it's nice to have like a string of gigs, and then I'm like, I think I don't want to play this music anymore after like a, a little bit like I don't know what the expect sometimes I don't know what the expectation is like for myself but I want like I want to keep uh, how long before I start playing the music or and what does that look like well yeah. I've had some success here and there but in, in booking gigs but I also know it takes me like a long time to write music which is I've been doing it. It's, it hasn't gotten any faster. I'm... <laughs> well, how do you? Yeah, can, how do you do it then? Like, what's, uh, what's? I, in, in recent times, I've tried some things. I used to be very concerned or like overly concerned with harmony, and so oftentimes, more often than not, right from the piano. And then recently, so I have. I'm lying. I, I have been composing, but recently. <laughs> Recently, I've been writing more melodies from the trumpet, which is different for me. It's like a, it's more like a bottom, a top-down approach, or usually it's more like a bottom-up approach. So sometimes I start on piano, and then it just kind of stacks up this way, and then uh, now I've been like composing on the trumpet, and then and, and moving down from there, like, and I'm trying to get them to meet in the middle, so to speak, you know. Yeah. What have you found? By doing that, like, has it changed the the outcome? A little bit, yeah. Because I, I kind of play the piano. So a lot of things can be, or are inspired by piano playing, which, and I'm thinking about that. Mm -hmm. When I play from the trumpet, it's, it's very monophonic. I am, it's almost like I'm decoding the harmony afterwards. Uh, after the fact, but I like having like these long, like kind of like streams of consciousness, or or just uh, taking like the the verbatim piece of what I played on a recording, and that's part of that is a uh, oh, so you're um, you're playing and recording your your trumpet playing, yeah. and then okay, got it, which is a a big inspiration and a thing I got. Um, started like trying to do in a way uh from steve coleman which is he's like a it's it's mind-blowing like the depth of his improvisation as it turns into composition hmm. those have been ways that i've made compositions recently older ways where i used to just write like very involved like little passages and I would like turn my nose up at each one of them <laughs> and revisit them like much later. And I could find something with them, mm. uh, you know, over time. Um, yeah, you mentioned like you've learned so much from Steve in terms of composition. What, what are some things that standout moments mm -hmm. that have maybe affected you or changed you uh there was this one recording session i really early on something with the 64 paths i don't remember the exact title and there was no music on the day of the recording hmm. <laughs> 
And I was, I don't know, I was worried. Not for him, for me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there might have been a composition or two. I don't, I don't recall, but he was writing music the, in the studio. Yeah. And it wasn't, we worked like the whole thing out. It's beautiful. He, he had... had a system he was working with, which was um, like coins, and he was working using the uh, I King as. I don't want to. I don't want to mess it yeah, up. Yeah, I understand. All right. Well, I, I want. You there was know. like a probability of like three coins, and this was like determining rhythms and. Okay. And. There was a, there was a lot going on. But okay. Basically, there was no, the music was being made that morning. Wow. And it was not all of it, but there was a couple of. What did you take from that? At the time. Well, I don't know. Uh, or, or the, now, at or the, or at the time. At what the time, it? I was just annoyed. I was. Uh, <laughs> I was really young. How old are you when you made that album? Maybe twenty. Oh, nineteen. Dang. Wow. But it was just me, like. I, I, I don't want anything to like arrive that I again For I sure, can't play yeah. or or I'm gonna have problems with or you know that's just you know me thinking about myself it's ridiculous but it <laughs> well it's understandable it's understandable but it's not music you know that you know but that's one of those things about that band that I'll say is it's one of the beautiful things about it is like the notion of preparedness has to go out the window. Mm. Because he's always pushing to something that he himself is uncomfortable with or hasn't done. And you got to join him. You got to join him in the journey, you know? And mm -hmm. they're not all successful, but amazing things happen all the time because we're trying things all yeah. the time. And the, the spirit of the band is to try things all the time. Sure, we play a lot of, there's there's things that anybody who's come to the concert has heard before, but there's always gonna be something that you've never heard before and that we've never tried before, which is <laughs> what I love in large part about playing with that group, amongst many other things. Um, what What's he like? as a to hang out with or or as a person uh i would say your your best bet is to ask questions and be ready for a staid response of of like musical history and experience and like it's it's coming at you so he's like a kind of a teacher role yeah big time it, okay big time um, and very inspirational. Uh, it's, it's wealth of, of knowledge and experience, like, all the time. It's, it's very inspiring, and it's, it just keeps, he stays in this place, which is really amazing. Um, how, how did it come to be that you were playing in his band? It's, I, was it 18? When you started playing with him, yeah, I think so. How did that? There about. How did that come uh, He, he was teaching at uh, Cal Berkeley, and I was going to Berkeley High School. I don't know the exact particulars of this, but Daphne Prieto and Anthony Tid were also like in Berkeley for a spell, and one night at a jam session. I think I saw Anthony and Daphne, or just Anthony, I can't re recall. This place called the Bison Brewery, which I'm pretty sure is not there anymore. And met Anthony, and then I think Anthony said something to Steve, and then Steve, in this role of spreading information, came to my high school and, and did a workshop. But that's kind of like where I met him as a quasi-adult. That was like 
2000, thereabouts. Because I was getting ready to graduate from high school. Wow, that's, uh, yeah, I can't, I mean, you can't even imagine the growth and just uh, playing somebody's music for 20 some years. Pretty incredible. Robert Porter. <laughs> can you tell me about him? Oh, man. I can. Um, it's funny because uh, I think about it more and more as an adult. I'm like, I knew him as like, I was a kid. And he had lived probably two lives by that point, or at least a life and a half. But we met him. It was me and Ambrose Akimusuri. And we had just become friends. We played this like a concert together at the Henry J. Kaiser Center in Oakland. And it was uh, it was like an amalgam of Oakland, Oakland public school bands. So he went to another school or he something? Went to a different school, but we had the same trumpet teacher. That was Robert? No, his name was Leonard Kaysan. He he taught at one school. I think Rambos went to school for. Uh, we went to the same middle school, but not the same uh, grade schools. I forget where he went. Uh, but Leonard Kaysan taught at both. And there was, there was a rehearsal for this. And the room was just it was like filled with kids and like saxophones and trombones it was just like a sea of instruments and you couldn't see anybody and i don't know if there were three or four schools but each one was kind of like sectioned off so your school was over here and it was just instruments and kids everywhere and uh leonard mr Kason says all right uh we're playing this song I'm like this passage at number three jonathan play this play it so they can know how it's supposed to sound and I, and I go, bong, da, 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 da. and then he goes, all right, uh, section four, Ambrose, play it and, and, you know, let the kids know how it's supposed to sound. And it's like, and I don't see him. I just hear another trumpet across the hall, you know. And then when we finally got to the, uh, the concert, we were sitting next to each other. <laughs> and we were just telling jokes and cracking up. And, and then um, he said i have this uh he had this pamphlet about a jazz workshop at the alice art center in downtown oakland is this ambrose uh-huh uh -huh. he's like let's let's do this have your mom call my mom or whatever you know <laughs> 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 i i got the information i signed up he signed up and then i, I, I don't know we like met outside on like the first day and we were like sitting on the stairs. He he walked up. He saw us sitting there with our trumpets. Robert. Robert. Yeah. yeah. And he I don't know, he was like talking. He said, "Oh man, I'm gonna give you guys lessons." Or it was it wasn't quite like that. But anyways, he sees us on the the steps, and we're like cracking jokes or whatever we're doing. And he said, "I'm gonna give both of you guys lessons, man. You guys are." You guys are going to be great or something like that. We hadn't played a note, word, said nothing really. And he did. I mean, this, this was my introduction to the music, but this was like my introduction to playing jazz. After the workshop, we figured out, like, you know, had my mom talk to your mom. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we we figured that or that thing out. You know, okay, yeah. For the lessons, and then he gave us lessons free of charge for I don't know how long. Really? Yeah. Man, that's beautiful. He played a a steady jam session at this place in North Oakland called the Birdcage, and it was always a it was always a Sunday night. I convinced my mom, you know, to take me to the birdcage to play. Here, I did a bunch of gigs with him. You know, again, like my impression of him is like as a teenager, a young teenager at that. Because um, I can't, I think he died in like 
like senior year of high school? Or... Oh, no kidding. Yeah. So he never really got to see. No. Because uh. he, he was, I mean, he was old, old, but he was older when I, he was incredible giving. Beyond the lessons, um, which were, we would meet at this, like, he, he knew people, he had, like, access to, like, different things, space. Uh, he, he was incredible in, with his time and just his, his patience with us, you know. Uh, especially me. His sessions, you know, we were always welcome. What really, were you working on with him? He used to give us a ton of things to listen to. He used to make tapes for us. He had really beautiful penmanship. And he'd like make these cassette tapes. He would write out the, t like the people and everything on the, uh, like a mixtape kind of thing. Yeah, and he would record it from a an LP. That's beautiful, man. <laughs> or it would just say like put the, the sticker on it. Yeah. Like Kenny Dorham, Epitaph, <laughs> Trumpetta Toccata. <laughs> That's amazing. Got us all into, well, at least got Ambrose and I into uh, buying vinyl. He was a collector. Of, of, of vinyl? vinyl? And mm. he, he got me into the collecting, and he used to know all the people. But I would go around with him, and he would say, you should get this, you should get that, and blah, blah, blah. And then I even sold records with him once, which was a lot of fun. At a, Away. What would you tell an 18-year-old oh, version of yourself? Tell myself at 18 and learn how to practice. How about that? But is that really what I'd tell myself? I'm not, I'm not certain. Yeah, your 18-year-old version of yourself is like, He's screw not, you, man. He doesn't want to hear that. What would I, what would I tell my 18-year-old self? Take your time. And be patient. That's good. I like that. That's a good one. I mean, I'm here, so... You did something right. Yeah, this is awesome. Thanks. Thank you. Well, I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Thank you again, Jonathan, for stopping by, and thank you for dropping by. And please don't forget to like and subscribe. And I'll see you around when I'll see you when I see you. Bye.